Commissioner Davis, I just can't hear her. I have no audio. <laughs> Oh, Commissioner Deerhake, we can hear you. Commissioner Bailey? And Commissioner Carter? Okay, I see Commissioner Carter. We, looks like he's just muted. Look, we have everyone. Let's go ahead and Get the meeting of the air quality committee started. Actually, let me check is council Reynolds on. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was muted. I'm here. Okay. I am. I'm here as well. Madam chair. Okay, great. Thank you. Go ahead and call this meeting of the air quality committee to order. For general statute section 138 a 15 mandates that the chair inquire as to whether any member knows of any known conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to matters before the commission. If any member knows of a conflict of interest or appearance of a conflict, please so state at this time. Hearing none, let's move on to the minutes. Did everyone have a chance to take a look at the minutes? Seeing nodding, is there are there any edits or changes to the minutes? Okay, hearing none, do we have a motion on the minutes? This is Commissioner Davis. I move approval of the Air Quality Committee meeting minutes. Thank you. And do we have a second? It's Commissioner Lazoric, I'll second. Okay, thank you. So since we're remote, let's just go ahead and do a roll call vote here. Uh, Commissioner Carter. Okay, I'll come back. Commissioner Bailey. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Morning. How do you vote on the minutes? Okay, I'll come back. Commissioner Davis. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Deerhag. Back also, Commissioner Lazoric. Yes. And Commissioner Monist. Yes. I think we're having some audio issues. Uh, Commissioner Bailey, could you put your thumbs up if you approve the minutes? Great. Can you hear me now? I yes, can. We just heard you. And Commissioner Deerhake. Let's see. I think that we're just going to have 1 of these days today. That's okay. <laughs> With audio council run with the minutes passed. Do we need to complete the official vote for the record? I'm sorry, Madam chair. When you say complete the official vote, you have a majority. I didn't hear anyone. Expressing an opposition and considering it's more of a ministerial matter. You can. Deem the matter of uh, the motion to have passed uh, without objection. Okay, great. Thank you. Motion passes. So today we just have 1 informational item. We're going to hear from the various section chiefs. I'm not sure if the order in the agenda is the order that. The presentations will follow and see nodding from director. Gifts. Okay, so is Patrick Butler online? Yes, I am here. Great. The floor is yours. Thank you. All right, can everyone see my screen? All yeah. right. Um, well, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, before the Air Quality Committee and uh, appreciate this opportunity. And I'll get started, um, try to keep my presentation to 10 minutes. Um, so a little bit about the way the ambient monitoring section is organized. I report straight to Mike Abrazinskis and I have three branch supervisors with supporting staff and uh, a couple of other positions that report to me. Um, it's pretty basic layout. Um, we operate about 38 monitoring sites that have shelters. Um, and these, this slide here is just informational. Uh, the 
these are this is what our sites typically look like. This happens to be the last two sites we put in, one in Lenore early in 21 and the one in uh, uh, Cumberland County at, at Wade in uh, the fall of 21. Um, so we met a lot of federal requirements in 21, and these are annual requirements that uh, we certified our, our air monitoring data on April 30th. It was due May 1st. Uh, we posted uh, our annual network plan for comment and uh, put it on our website. And it was uh, due July 1st. Uh, we did our annual competency certification in August. We do that every year in August. And it was a big year. We uh, we propped up all the uh, infrastructure for our photochemical assessment monitoring station at the Millbrook site and had all that stuff uh, in place by June 1st. Um, we also had some shifts in the ambient monitoring program where we started uh, using a outside contractor RTI uh, that they now weigh our um, gravimetric uh, filter samples, our PM25 samples. They started in July. That seems to be going well. Um, we had a lot of issues with our in-house lab with temperature requirements and such. So uh, it, it just seemed like a, a, a better budgetary move to, to outsource that. Um, we do an annual monitoring workshop every year in February. Uh, we, we did a virtual one on February 3rd and we're planning to do one uh, February 9th of this year. Um, we have rainwater sites um, that you're all probably familiar with. Uh, we do five near site, near uh, near facility sites around Comores, and then we run seven background sites across the state. Currently, uh, Division of Water Resources does our PFAS analysis. Um, so our PAMS equipment at the Millbrook site, these are two of our big hitters out there. Uh, the one on the left is a, a celiometer uh, that measures cloud depth and does a lot of <laughs> scientific stuff. I'm not a meteorologist, uh, but it provides a ton of data so that you can analyze uh, mixing layers and things like that. The uh, equipment on the right is our auto GC, uh, and it analyzes the samples uh, for, I think, about 57 different pollutants. We, as far as our wet deposition, wet and dry deposition network, um, th this is some the typical equipment that's used. Uh, the going from left to right, uh, that's our NOAA rain gauge. The one in the middle is our bucket sampler, and the little um, piece on the top, it can slide back and forth to collect dry or wet. It has a, a rain sensor to move that. Uh, that's how we get dry samples and wet samples. Um, and on the far right, that's a a, uh, a met piece of met equipment um, that we use out at uh, the fish farm, one of one of the sites. Um, so things of interest in the ambient program, we've been impacted a lot with uh, tropical weather. I would just categorize it as that. Every single year, um, we've had impacts from. From hurricanes, I won't list all these things, but um, I'm really hoping that this year we don't have a hurricane impact North Carolina, like a lot of other folks. And I know you guys feel the same way. Um, but it's a strain. It's uh, something we do to try to try to uh, protect our equipment and protect our folks, and and do that all uh, at the same time that this pandemic's going on. So it's kind of a logistical challenge when it happens, especially recently. Um, we run. Uh, well, we were running an H2S monitor at the Waxhaw site in Union County, and we have a site in, at the Ballantyne uh, Park in Mecklenburg. And um, we at, we started the pro the project. We had some a couple of really old Jerome meters. One of them died shortly after the study started, so we were running just one at Waxhaw, and then that Waxhaw one um, had some issues right before Christmas. And so they're not they're, there's not a um, H2S drone meter that's functioning at the moment, but the data that we collected is posted on the web, and I got that on the slides next. So I'll, I'll kind of illustrate what it looks like. Um, we're also analyzing canisters for uh, for Mecklenburg County at the uh, Huntersville site, 
and that's in relation to the colonial pipeline spill and those samples are being collected weekly and we send the results back to Mecklenburg. Um, this is this is what it looks like. This is the Waxaw water tower site and uh, the one on the right is the Valentine site. Um, they're still set up out there. Like I said, the Jerome meter is dead right now. Um, that's what it looks like. Um, we had, and, and just one point of, 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 of note here, we had to move the Waxaw site because the it's at a water tower site and the water tower was being painted. So we shifted it over to the Valentine site um, while that uh, was happening. So it's kind of fortunate that we had two sites and, and one piece of equipment just kind of worked out for us. Um, this is what the data that's posted out on the web looks like. Um, the blue dots or, or the blue uh, part of the graph is the wax all site and the green is the Valentine. Um, and you can see where we were uh, early on in the study from April to say June, I don't have the exact date, but sometime in June, we were running both the monitors. At that point, one of the monitors quit on us. So then you see the blue that continues out to October. Um, that was the Waxall site monitor. And then there was a week in there in between where we were moving the equipment that we weren't sampling. And then the green at the far right of the graph is what we collected at the Valentine site. So along about uh, December 10th, uh, we, we don't have any data after that, but that, this is our data. Just a few points to mention here, that's the ASTDR uh, uh, line up there at 70 PPB. Um, it's well below that. And I think our, uh, our AAL is, if I remember right, it's somewhere around 120 PPB. So we're well under uh, the standards uh, for what we've monitored out there. One thing I will mention, that green line that uh, correlates with, uh, with all the data, that's the, I would say that's the mean odor threshold. Most people can detect uh, H2S at about eight PPB. So that's what that green line means. And as you all know, there's, there was a lot of complaints that come in when people smell the, uh, the rotten egg smell from hydrogen sulfide. Um, this is our, uh, the Mecklenburg calls it their Oler site. Uh, we call it the Huntersville, same thing. This is what the, the Zontec 911 canister looks like out there. This is what we're analyzing weekly. Um, the right underneath the tripod, that's the, that's the can that's shipped back and forth, back to us to analyze. And then another can is put there to, to draw another sample. Um, on the horizon, Let's see. We've got uh, we've we've got some stuff in the, in the works to purchase an eSIM system, which will help us track and, and store our QA documentation and our service to our sites. Uh, we're hoping to get that stood up this year and and, and working. Um, we've got our next technical systems audit coming at the end of the last full week of May. The last one we did was in uh, March of 2019, and uh, we've done a lot of work to get ready for this. Um, we have received the co-location shelter that we want to put out at our, our Millbrook site. Um, but we got some, I'll just scroll to that slide. This is what it looks like. Um, we have some, some concerns about the way it was constructed. The EPA did this, uh, sent it to us, um, and we were, we were testing it out to see if there's any kind of restrictive air flows before we put it out at Millbrook. But that's another side project. And this is for the people who want to place a uh, personal air sensor at our site to kind of compare with what we get from our Millbrook site. Um, let's see. Just a few few words here about our quality assurance program. Uh, we have a lot of QAPS quality assurance project plans. And right now we have about five of them over at EPA under review. We got one that uh, we're going to send over there um, fairly soon, uh, but these documents are all out on the website, the DEQ, DAQ website, along with our SOPs. And uh, each of these QAPs runs anywhere from 100 and, I don't know, 110 pages to 200 pages. So this, this is a staff intensive thing that we work on. And the way our program evolves, these are under constant um, revision and, and work. So just wanna make note of that. Um, and I'll stop here for, that's kind of a whirlwind tour of, uh, of air quality. 
and I'll take any questions any, anybody has. Since we can't see everyone, I'm just going to go down the attendance list to see if anyone has questions. Um, Commissioner Carter? None at this time. Commissioner Bailey? Uh, yes, I was just curious uh, when I worked for the state a while ago, um, we had a fish processing plant in the Beaufort area where the Menhaden would. Um, maybe sit too long and cause problems with odor in the community. How do we deal with it now? Because back then we just sent an inspector out. Um, like, do you set up a monitoring station for something like that? And what would be the, what would be monitored in the event of rotting Manhattan? Just curious. Yeah, um, no, we, we, you know, our regional officers still respond to uh, citizens complaints that any, any facility that uh, the, the citizens complain about. Uh, we use techniques like odor logs. Um, we try to really pinpoint uh, with the facility first. These are first actions. We try to pinpoint uh, with the facility what might have been going on at the time that the uh, observance uh, happened. And we correlate that data to meteorological data. We look at production data. We look at practices and, and procedures and operations that the facility had going on. And a lot of times we find out from that there was something that that was, you know, I don't, you know, just hypothetically, like with a Menhaden plant, maybe they uh, didn't get to process the uh, the product in a timely manner. These are things that we won't learn unless we go to the site and, and interview the, the staff there and check the records and the log books and things like that. The, the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems we face in Ambient is I've, we don't have a lot of staff um, to, to necessarily go out and stand up um, standalone work study uh, products. Um, I mean, just for instance, at the lab right now, uh, we've had a couple of chemists who left and took in other more lucrative uh, positions, and I got three people retiring before June out of a staff of, of eight. So I, we have to really sit down and talk about resources and, and, uh, and time before we, we implement a study. Um, but, but we will do whatever is required, such as the case of uh, of the new Indy uh, study out in the Union and in, uh, in Mecklenburg counties. It's not something we, we, we do frequently and we have to weigh a, a measured approach to it. But I would think, you know, I, I'm not very familiar with Menhaden, but uh, whatever the pollutants of concern are, there's, there's also, uh, you know, do they make equipment that measures, you know, what exactly we're looking at there and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. So, um, I hope I didn't ramble too much. I'm sorry if I went, went a little too far there, but no, did you, that help at all? <laughs> yeah, no, you didn't ramble too much. I was the attorney representing the department trying to do an enforcement action for violations of the odor regulations. And it would have been nice to have had an, a monitor out there is what I was thinking. And I was interested in what you were doing with H2S. So, like I said, I was just curious because I had to go through days of of um trial so thank you yeah, very much sure. yes ma'am commissioner davis no i don't have any questions thank you commissioner deerhick yeah. i'm just barely hear you okay i'll speak up <laughs> is that better that's better okay thank you First of all, as someone who's had to prepare quality assurance project plans for EPA over the years, my heart goes out to you. I know it's a rigorous process, so thank you for, for doing that. It's a, it's a very um, uh, important process, and uh, the, the QA is such an essential part of this data collection and data management and analysis, so thank you for that. Thank you. Real follow up, a quick follow up about the odor. For odor detection, are you still using um, trained individuals as opposed to technology? What's the state of technology on odor analysis now? Well, uh, I, I guess, you know, to, to go back to something I learned a long time ago that the human nose is a, is a very sensitive instrument. And so, yes, we, we do rely heavily on uh, folks that go out and, and do um, odor evaluations. Um, 
the thing with odors too, as you as you know, uh, Ms. Deerhay, uh, it, it depends on the odor too as to what kind of technology might be available to to uh, detect at the at the odor threshold level. So um, it, it's different in different situations. I can I, I know just for that Valentine uh, or the New Indy study that those Jerome meters uh, really weren't designed to you know put out on site and run 24 hours a day, but we have some pretty technically ingenious staff that adopted a way to make those things uh, operate continuously. And that's probably the strain that we put on them is probably what did them in. But um, there are H2S monitoring equipment that you can put out that's very expensive. Uh, you have to deal with um, power issues and site locations and, and things like that to get them stood up. But you know, I, I think, I guess I'll stop there and say, it depends on the particular odor situation uh, as to what we can do. Quick monitor probably is designed more for oil rigs. And uh, I'm sorry, I, that a lot of what you said cut out on me. Probably on the market is designed more for oil rigs than for animal operations. That, yeah, that, I understand the expense for that. Mm -hmm. um, questions. You mentioned hydrogen sulfide monitors. Did you mention you had two monitors in the state or? Uh, yes, ma'am. We had we had when we started that new Indy study, we had two Jerome meters and they were actually 15 plus years old and not long after the study, one of them just completely uh, died <laughs> and then the other one um made it till right before christmas and it and it did the same thing so um we we looked into you know what can you do to but you know if we could repair it but they were just basically old and and they they've outlived their purpose right now the um the pm 2.5 filter work that's being done off site at rti are they doing speciation for you as well? Um, they don't do our speciation, but we 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 do we can do speciation through another EPA um, outsource. That but RTI is basically just doing the the uh, the, the weighing and giving us the data to look at for the the, the weights on the on the filters. Okay. Well, that, that links to a, a comment about my continued interest in ammonia, ambient ammonia emissions and monitoring and looking for speciated ammonium particulates in your PM filters. Uh, I continue to be interested in the role of ammonia around animal operations, not only for deposition, but also for PM fine formation. So I'll just put that request out there again for y'all to consider. Thank yes, ma'am. Thank you. Commissioner Lasoric. No questions. And Commissioner Modest. No questions. Thank you. Great. Well, I think if that's all the questions for Mr. Butler, we'll let him go. Thank you for your presentation. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Next up, we we're going to hear from the permitting section. Is someone here ready to present? Yes, this is uh, Mark Stawella, um, permitting chief. Can you see my slides? We can. Okay. So, um, what I thought I would talk talk about this morning um, are a few few items. We'll start with a little bit of applications, trends, statistics. We'll move into the Title V program review and its findings. Um, then uh, a little bit of staffing updates and uh, an issue on the 18 month clock. And then finally, we'll wrap up a little bit of environmental justice and the permitting process. This is a, um, a current representation of the facility counts in North Carolina. Um, 
the permitting workload as a as a way of reminder the permitting workload is all title five operations are done on a central office and all the non title five the smalls and synthetic miners are done at the seven regional level so office level the numbers here are current um, also real quick uh, those that are shown there as registered or exempt are former small facilities that availed themselves of rule changes that allowed them to um, essentially get out of some of the permitting responsibilities. Um, <clears throat> this graph represents a uh, four year look at application trends, both incoming and outgoing. Uh, this is Title V specific. Um, and when I say applications, um, these are everything from renewals to to modifications to ownership changes and the closeouts are could be a permit issued. It could be permit withdrawn, consolidated, etc. Uh, what you do see is a general. Growth of incoming applications, which is. Even um, represented. During the, the COVID period of 2020 and 2021, we see a general rise in incoming applications. And we were trending with outgoing application or permits or actions um, right along with them. Um, had a slight dip last year um, in some of the, the slides that I'll present may have some of the causes for that for those dips. This is a little busy slide, I understand, um, but this pictorial of the current workload of the Title V section, this represents 214 applications, the larger pie sections being the, the modifications and the renewals. Um, and, and with that, those two sections are often the ones that are the most time um, consuming applications. And then for your for your awareness, uh, 214 applications with my current staffing is about 10 and a half applications each engineer. <clears throat> Moving on to EPA's uh, evaluation of our Title V program, the, these bullets represent the the why of of why those actions are taking place. In 2002, uh, Office of Inspector General created an audit and required EPA to perform reviews on roughly a five-year cycle. Um, you can see the years that North Carolina's program was reviewed, including um, 2021. Uh, the last bullet there are items as part of that review, staffing, management, revenues, what we do for public participation and environmental justice. It looked at permit issuance rates, and then it also included a detailed review of 10 permits where they uh, pulled the permits, pulled the files, virtually of course, and uh, made their recommendations globally. So the findings, um, we'll start with the positive findings. Here's, here's a bulleted list of what was identified in the report. I am particularly, as chief, I'm particularly um, uh, favored of the first and the last um, bullet points there. EPA felt that we had a very qualified, experienced staff and uh, had very good management resources um, to perform the program. And they believed our permits were thorough and, and very well written. So I'm particularly proud of that. One of the areas that they highlighted that we monitor is what they consider a backlog. And, and I'll, I'm targeting renewals here because that was what their report focused on. And at that time, we had 15 applications, renewal applications that had been in-house longer than 18 months. And I'll talk a little bit more about, the, well, the 18 month is a statutory requirement that we issue permits by once a, an application is deemed complete. 
EPA did, as part of the discussions in the final interview with us, acknowledge that North Carolina is not alone in having backlogs and that between all the states and all the local programs in Region 4, there are only two that didn't have a backlog. So, um, for me, it would be nice to be on that list and we're working towards it and we're, as a staff, we're trying um, our best to minimize the number of backlog permits that we have. EPA also identified some, identified some action items. Uh, the first and the third bullet here on this slide, uh, the amended Title V fee schedule and the uh, rule modifications to uh, clarify and ensure that we're meeting those 18 month time frame. The fee passage has been completed as of November 18th. We have a new uh, Title V fee system in place. That was part of that long stakeholders group um, process. And the rule revisions that speak of the 18 month time frame. Um, are part of the rule package that you have, you all have um, approved to go to public notice um, and public comment. So those are in process as well. Additional recommendations um, that the EPA mentioned, uh, they were recommended that we do periodic workload assessments. That is something I do um, with my supervisors almost continually. Um, to make sure that we're keeping workload assigned and flowing. Um, the middle two bullets had mostly to do with their review of our um, finances and budget. And, and lastly, they recommended that we put a, um, a link to the, on our website in the permit application process, a link to the DEQ community mapping system, which I'll speak a little bit more about when we get to the EJ. Um, and then finally, as part of the targeted review, they made comments that were specific to those permits, but we could apply them generally. Um, one to promote consistency, which um, and and work on our what we call our permit shells and general conditions, so that engineers have a a consistent basis uh, for, for moving process, projects through the, the system. And generally, these were style guides and, and formatting of our permits. There were some, none of, none of which were really um, technical in nature. Um, so we, we were happy to see that. One of the biggest change um, came from our own AG's office. Uh, we've recently implemented um, new language that discusses third party uh, rights to contested case, and we have a new attachment. There will be, um, that attachment will be part of all the new Title V issued this year. Um, and that is also being added to the non Title V permits as well. I want to talk a little bit about staffing. Patrick gave you his his org chart. Um, I haven't done that here, but um, my full staff, including engineers, supervisors, and our air quality analysis branch, normally is 28. I'm down three engineers due to promotions, retirements, and resignations. Um, and as part of an annual uh, succession. Uh, process, we do informal staff surveys. And as you can see, I have a staff that is not only well experienced, but further along in their careers and in looking out and in trying to plan, um, I could possibly lose half my staff in the next five years, um, which would include uh, two of my three supervisors and the permitting chief itself as possibilities. Um, so we are actively looking at cross training engineers um, so that we, we don't have source sectors that are left uncovered when, when an engineer leaves. Um, 
and we need to make sure that we are up on the hiring process and we get the best candidates in when we are allowed to hire. Uh, so going circling back to the 18 month clock status, um, per rule, part part 70, um, there are certain permits that require that the division issue them within 18 months of being uh, deemed complete. And those are the ones, and that would include the public comment and the EPA review period time. Um, and those are significant uh, modifications, renewals, Title V first times. So currently, as of today, I've got 17 that are exceeding that 18 month clock. And you can see how the breakdown first time renewals. And so comparing that to the status where we were at EPH um, report, we are making great headway on that. We reduce the numbers and we continue to do so. You know, transition a little bit here to environmental justice and public participation. As a reminder, um, the current public participation process for Title V, um, most but not all require by rule public comment periods. Um, those that don't, and we is mostly determined by pub, um, public interest on whether or not we hold a public hearing or uh, go out for a 30 day comment period. That differs for the non title fives. The rules do not require automatically public um, comment periods for those permits. So those are left to those that rise to significant public interest and as determined by our director. So, in addition to our rules, there are a few policies that we have to operate under. One is the public participation, excuse me, participation plan. Um, and that's to ensure consistency um, in implementing the, the public outreach and engagement strategies. And there's a there's a link to that policy here. In addition to that public participation, there's also the, the limited English proficiency policy. Um, where the division looks at a project area, determines the, the LEP level, and uh, requires translation or interpretation services based on um, those levels. All of that is involved, um, included as part of the, the Secretary's Environmental Justice um, Program. And here's the definition of what environmental justice is and the criteria that is used and analyzed with uh, under that system. Each division has a what we call triggering permit applications that automatically um, get rolled into the EJ program for DAQ, we have designated our triggering programs as any new Title V facility, Greenfield, um, any PSD level permit, and any other that rises to the um, director's discretion, again, based on what we believe and feel would be significant public interest. And there's a link there on that slide to um, example EJ reviews. It should be noted that an EJ review um, based on that criteria is demographic in nature only. It is established to create what additional enhanced public engagement should be undertaken by a division. It is not a technical um, document. If they don't don't ever comment on the technical nature of uh, of what is being done as part of a permit process. The EJ uh, program is based off of uh, this um, tool that, that the department uses. It's very similar to EPA's EJ screen um, and incorporates many um, of those criteria. And the reports are to show demographics, uh, information in and around an area of a facility, 
highlight those communities that may be affected in um, in, in uh, a pictorial version. <clears throat> so you can see with the EJ, um, it adds a lot of work and, and time. We um, make it a point in all applicant meetings to mention the possibility of EJ. We uh, propose that they uh, meet with the communities early on. Um, and what we always tell them is don't let the community's first knowledge of a facility be when the division um, notices a permit in the paper on our website. So with that, um, I can take any questions you all may have. Great, um, Commissioner Carter. None. Commissioner Bailey. Yes, thank you. Um, when I worked for a company and we were modifying our air permit application, Title V permit, um, you know, we do the modeling and this wasn't part of an EJ analysis, but as we did the modeling, we realized that we might have to shift the position of different um, facilities within the plant, different stacks. And so we would be doing that in order to comply with um, the standards at the property boundary. So when you're doing an environmental justice analysis, um, does that company end up changing positions of things because the uh, because of where a residential community might be in relation to the plant? I, I don't believe that level of detail is in the EJ reports. Um, that is mostly handled, um, again, through the permitting process, through any models that are submitted for the, the toxics program or if at the PSD level. But very rarely does the EJ component uh, cause a facility to to move within its own boundaries. So I, I'd say no, ma'am. So what, what changes then might end up being required because of the EJ analysis? I think what your answer is, is that, well, we're requiring people to meet the standards at the property boundary for other reasons. So I guess what I'd like to know is what is what ends up with the EJ analysis? Right. Oh, yes, yes, ma'am. Um, the, the EJ analysis, um, again, they put a pin in the, in the proposed project, draw a circle around it, and then look within that circle to see what type of communities exist, what kind of sensitive populations. Is it located near a school, retirement homes, hospitals, um, lower income, you know, the, the demographic? And its purpose is just to provide recommendations to the divisions on how they should let those sensitive populations know what that facility is doing, what type, what level of emissions. So it, it it's mostly a, a public participation process, not a not a technical one. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Davis. No, no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Deerhake. You just another question or two about the EJ. Could you put an enlargement of that dashboard up on the screen? It was a little difficult to see. Uh, let's see. I don't know how I can. Well, that's this larger. I can see a little bit better now. Um, you have a health dashboard, average heart disease. So, so you do. Uh, perform a health statistics review as part of the EJ analysis. Um, Mike, you want to help me on this one? Um, hey, sure, Mark. Mark um, this is Michael Pajetra, Deputy Director with the Division of Air Quality. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, included in the uh, Environmental Justice Report um, 
uh, well, included in the dashboard that's available through uh, our tools, uh, we can see that data. Um, most of the information included in the EJ report deals with the socioeconomic uh, uh, status of the individuals, as Mark indicated, because that's what we're using to determine the best way to do outreach. So we're really looking for like limited English proficiency or uh, other languages or um, other means of communicating with folks. And that then drives the way that we do outreach to ensure that uh, uh, members of the community become uh, familiar with it. For instance, if there's sensitive receptors in the area, we'll provide information to those receptors on um, you know, the project itself so that they can uh, become informed and uh, then provide input as, as they deem necessary. So the health-based data is available. Um, again, not a crucial portion of the EJ report, which focuses for our purposes more on how we do outreach. Thank you. So the, the outreach is extremely important for noticing new facilities or changes in facilities, but I, I really think that the EJ role should continue throughout the permitting and in um, anticipating what potential health outcomes could be from the installation of the facility. Uh, do you, do you, does the division go to that extent? Um, and at this time, uh, again, we're using it primarily for outreach with the goal of our permitting program to ensure compliance with the national ambient air quality standards for every facility. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Lazorek. Um, yes, thank you for this presentation. And also just where you went through the comments from EPA, I mean, just kudos for the positives that were noted in that. Um, my question though is about where they had suggestions for improvement or what's the timeline or, you know, to, for addressing those. Um, and I, and uh, I wanted to ask a little bit more about what they, what was stated about um, sal the salary plan or something like that. If you could expand on that a little bit. I'll, I'll let um, our director, deputy director, speak to the salary plan, but many of the recommendations did not have timelines on them. Uh, for example, the 18 month clock issue, they knew that required rulemaking. So that is an extended process. Um, a lot of the items that they suggested were ones that we could make changes globally on change our shells change the way we process applications uh, add. Um, so a lot of their recommendations have are already in the process of being implemented even before, in some cases, rulemaking is done. Um, so that, I, that's that piece um, as far as the, the, the financial aspect of it, maybe the director, deputy director have more to add. Yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner Lazorek. This is Micah Brzezinskis. Um, I can touch on what EPA said about our salary administration plan. On the positive side, they said that they love the fact that we have a salary administration plan. On the negative side, they, they said that they really dislike the fact that we can't fund it. So, um, you know, that that's certainly the current state of affairs. And, and, and again, our salary administration plan is there to address inequities, retention, uh, and the silver tsunami that Mark spoke of, you know, we're looking at 50% of our permit engineers that do the heavy lifting and what many of them do the heavy lifting can retire in the next uh, five years or less. So, uh, we have a plan for that, but it's not, it's not fully funded. So, so those are 1 of the challenges that we'll continue to work through as we move forward. Thank you. Commissioner Lazark, did you have a, any follow up to that? It looked like you were. Getting ready to say something. Well, I was just thinking back to the the salary plan being you know changed as that um, action moved forward, and and I mean and I I don't know if there's any role the EMC has in trying to revisit that uh, you know sooner rather than later um, to try to try to meet that concern of the EPA as well as um, to make sure that the needs of the state are met. As as we work through those matters, we'll, we'll certainly uh, keep y'all posted. And um, 
uh, and certainly it's a goal of ours in 2022 to not just look at that particular revenue stream to address that issue, but across the entire division. So that's that's a big goal of, of, of mine personally this year. And, and I'll speak a little bit to that at the end of all the presentations today. Commissioner Monist. I don't have any additional questions, but I appreciate the discussion. Thanks. One additional question um, during the pandemic, could you talk a little bit about how you all have been able to assess LEP levels with folks not being on the ground quite as much? And, uh, as far as my knowledge of the EJ process, um, this is all done at the departmental levels. Um, so I can't speak to how they were able to, other than through demographics, um, through whatever um, tools that they had. Um, there were times, I, I do believe, when that department did actually go make physical visits, even during the pandemic. Um, but outside of that, I can't speak to how it's been done. Yes, this is Michael Pajetra again, Deputy Director. Um, as Mark indicated, that's correct. Uh, LEP is primarily uh, determined through census data, uh, which has been integrated into our tool. And uh, our uh, EJA team has made uh, field visits uh, uh, following all appropriate um, uh, measures to uh, keep safe and keep uh, uh, citizens safe. Uh, but uh, they have gone out and uh, done some limited visits as needed. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Sala. Thank you. Next, we have Steve Hall. Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Share my screen. Okay. All right, so um, I, my name again is Steve Hall. I'm the technical services section chief um, for the Division of Air Quality. Um, the organization chart for my section, it's really two branches, stationary source compliance, um, which is uh, supervised by Gary Saunders and mobile source compliance, which is supervised by Brian Phillips. Uh, we also, uh, within the last year, has have hired uh, Sarah Kreuzer to help us with some uh, special um, technical projects we're working on. This next slide is um, kind of shows what we do on a day to day, week to week, month to month basis um, as a section, uh, both on the stationary source compliance side and the mobile source compliance side. Uh, and, and some special projects as well, but um, I'm going to focus on just a couple of items that have been kind of big projects or kind of uh, challenges over the last uh, couple of years. If you want more information on what we do in technical services uh, from the DAQ webpage, which a link is provided here, um, there, there are two tiles uh, that primarily um, points you to our information. The motor vehicles tile at the top left will uh, direct you to mobile source information and the compliance tile at the bottom, bottom left will point you to stationary source compliance information, including um, any inf information uh, there on civil penalty assessment, enforcement actions, things like that. So the first uh, major project that I'd like to spend a little time on is the uh, Volkswagen settlement. Uh, we have just finalized the phase two mitigation plan for North Carolina uh, after, a, um, after a public comment period um, and internal review and analysis of those comments and incorporation into the final plan. Uh, so all that was done at the end of last year and the plant, plant uh, Phase two plan was finalized right at the end of December. So we are entering um, the last phase of uh, grant funding uh, through the VW settlement. It, we're right at $68 million um, to invest 
in various eligible project projects and the categories uh, that are the most um, or the biggest category um, layouts are school bus replacement, transit bus replacement, clean heavy duty equipment and, and vehicle replacement, um, vehicles that would be eligible under the Federal Diesel Emission Reduction Act and, um, and zero emission vehicle infrastructure investment. So this is a, a pretty busy chart. Um, I'll leave it, uh, you know, in, if you want, I can come back to it later if you want to look at it in more detail, but I do just want to point out that, you know, the different uh, programs uh, as far as bus and vehicle replacement are at the top. Um, the relative percentages um, are to the, um, the second column to the right and the, the targeted, these are targeted percentages and targeted funding amounts. Uh, the funding amounts are at the far right. Um, towards the bottom, you have your zero emission vehicle infrastructure um, grants. Um, we are only allowed to invest up to 15% in those types of projects through the VW settlement and we're doing the full 15%. Um, adding in some some minimal uh, administration cost um, as as far as uh, I think we're allowed up to 15% in administration costs. We're only collecting 5% for for that. That brings the total um, right at just under 68 million dollars to uh, to go towards eligible grant projects in the next uh, two to four years. Or well. 2022 to 2024 is what we're what we're looking at for phase two. So the next step is to uh, re start releasing requests for proposals. We've decided in phase two to split the um, programs out a little bit as far as how we do the request for proposals, and um, you know so we can focus outreach on certain program areas. In phase one, we had transit bus, school bus, heavy duty, all kind of released at the same time. And uh, so it's, you know, there's different target audiences for those. So we plan to have lots of webinar and informational sessions along the way. And this will allow us to target those sessions to different um, potential grant applicants. We also plan new to, in phase two, plan to do um, some specific outreach to historically under-resourced counties. Uh, these are counties um, looking at both economic factors and uh, EJ factors. Um, these are counties that may not have staff or expertise or knowledge to identify el potential eligible projects and also to put together quality applications. So. We're looking all along the way uh, over the next six months of um, release of requests for proposals to, to get outreach towards those counties that we might not otherwise get applications from. So, and then uh, on the stationary source compliance side, I'd just like to take a few minutes to talk about the impacts of COVID-19. Um, our compliance inspection program in, in North Carolina is predicated on on-site visits. Um, we, we think uh, DAQ inspector presence on-site is critical to maintain compliance over time. And so we try to get out, um, out in the field as much as possible, particularly to our highest emitting facilities. We want um, boots on the ground as much as possible on-site. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously some challenges um, impacted us over the last couple of years with COVID-19. And uh, the next few graphs will show you how it how it's impacted us. But I'll say, first of all, that kudos to our staff. Uh, in, in my section, we help with uh, logistics and and and, um, and and some, you know, out and, and support. But the, the work of inspections is done by our regional staff and our seven regional offices, and they've done a great job over the last two years adapting and um, and doing all they can to ensure compliance um, with air quality regulations in North Carolina. So our goals, these are our typical goals and we really haven't changed our goals that much. We've had to kind of play catch up at times, but we haven't changed our goals. 
Um, the major emitting facilities, Title V and synthetic miners, or the potential for major emissions, we try to get out to those once a year to do a full compliance evaluation. Um, and then our secondary goal is to our lower emitting facilities, everybody else that we target for inspection once every other year. So if you look at that goal, um, we should be out in the field for all facility types uh, doing um, about 1,737 full compliance evaluations. That's an EPA term, FCE, uh, but that's what our goal is each year. So if you look at um, 2000, this is a federal fiscal year. So for the, the most recent federal fiscal year started October 1st, 2020 and ended September 30th, 2021. This is how we report our data to EPA. If you look at the federal fiscal years prior to COVID, we were well above that 1900 and, or make sure I got 1737 uh, inspections um, in COVID hit right in the middle of um, federal fiscal year 2020, and there were a couple of months that we didn't go out in the field at all because we were, we were, uh, we, there was a stay at home order, and then we were trying to make sure we had a uh, plan and procedures in place to ensure the safety of our inspectors and the people we come in contact with in the field. So April, May, into June of 2020, there wasn't hardly any on-site work, as you'll see in some other slides. But as we moved into federal fiscal year 2021, our, we started getting back out in the field more. There were still challenging situations. If you remember, we had a spike right at the end of um, federal fiscal year 2021. So uh, there were always taking precautions when there are potential COVID issues, but um, we, we did get out uh, we, in the field more uh, than in 2020. And these uh, different um, colors, the if you'll notice the blue are Title V, the purple is synthetic minor, and the green is just total facility FCEs for compliance evaluations. And the dip in Title V and synthetic minors was much less um, during COVID than the others. That's because that's where we try to focus our resources. Here's a graph that kind of shows what happened um, uh, right when uh, the stay at home order hit in 2020, end of March 2020. Prior to that time, we did very few partial inspections, um, but, uh, and, and then the, that's the blue graph, and the green graph is, um, is full compliance evaluations on site, because that's the only way we did full compliance evaluations um, prior to COVID. And so, so you see the green graph drops way uh, down to very few full compliance evaluations in April, May, and June, and our partials went way up. And the reason for that is um, is we started we, we, since we couldn't go on site, we had our inspectors call facilities and do video conferences and use other tools to determine their compliance status as best as possible off site but also to you know, maybe get emails of critical data or um, you know, remind them of upcoming requirements or compliance obligations. So we're doing as much as we could without actually being on site. And then in June, uh, mid-June of 2020, we finalized our procedures for getting back out on site and, and, and our inspectors responded and, and, and that curve jumped way up as far as on-site evaluations. Um, if you look, this is another look at partial compliance evaluations per federal fiscal year. Once again, you see a big jump in partial uh, evaluations in 2020. But the main thing to look at here is federal fiscal year 2021, we're down below where we were prior to COVID. A uh, lot, le much more a full compliance evaluations and on-site work. We didn't track off-site inspections prior to COVID. Uh, we started tracking that and backfilled that data for federal fiscal year 2020 uh, at EPA's request. So uh, you can see the number of off-site inspections we logged in federal fiscal year 2020, but that number came way down in federal fiscal year 2021. 
And so the last slide I have here is just pointing out of some other items, special projects that tech services staff have been working on. Uh, we work closely with management, both at the DEQ and DAQ level on the, the Gen X um, situation at Comores, um, where our team is involved with uh, developing, help developing testing methodology and reviewing testing and tracking Gen X admissions um, and, and, and even enforcement actions of, of late. Um, we also uh, provide technical support uh, to both management and to our regional offices on uh, various topics. We, uh, because of COVID-19, uh, there's, as you can imagine, not a lot of um, live training going on, in-person training. So we've had to secure opportunities for technical skills training that are online. And, and we've done a, a fairly good job of, of, of belling ourselves of those opportunities that are out there. Um, we've been working over the last couple of years on developing technology and procedures to shift DAQ away from paper records. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to launch a Laserfish uh, digital document repository for DAQ and continue our move towards electronic public records. And we also created a new grant management system to streamline the mobile source grant application process. And that system is fully up and um, running for phase two of the VW program. So that's my, my slides for the day. I'll be glad to take any questions you have and my contact information is here as well. Great, thank you. I know we're running over to our time right now. So I'm gonna go down the list real quickly and just ask that folks keep their questions to one. So we can keep moving on. Um, Commissioner Carter had to drop off. Commissioner Bailey. None. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. No, thank you. Commissioner Deerhag. We might be having audio problems. Again, Commissioner Lazorek. No questions. Uh, can you hear me now? Can yes. Me? Okay, thank you. I just thought I would take this opportunity to, to put in a request that when the staff has enough information about the recent federal legislation dealing with auto emissions and from a greenhouse gas perspective, as well as the new funding that is supposed to uh, lead to installation of charging stations around the nation. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Monist. Um, just thank you. I was especially excited about the, um, the school bus replacements as somebody who puts her seven year old on the bus every morning. Um, that's going to be really fun to see. Thanks. Certainly. Right. Well, thank you, Mr. Hall. Thank you. And Randy Strait has our final presentation. Good morning. I'm Randy Strait, section chief of the planning section. Just do a quick time check to um, we need to end this. You know, any thoughts on that, or just I, I'll take about ten minutes. We'll just apologize in advance to Commissioner Bailey for running yeah. into groundwater and waste management's time. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, anyway, I'm trying to share my screen here. Is it showing up? Not yet. Hmm. You can't see my screen. No. All right. Sorry about that. Let me go back and try it again. <clears throat> Can you see it now? I'm not seeing it. Um, I think everyone has access to your PowerPoint. Okay. So we can pull it up on our Katie, Katie, do you mind sharing it for me? I'm not sure what's going on, why my screen isn't sharing. Sure, I'll pull it up. Give me one minute. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait. I, okay, I've got it. Think. It's working. All right, there we go. 
Sorry about that. Let me do full screen share here. All right, good morning. Um, I'll try to go through this quickly. Um, and just so I'm Randy Strait, Chief of the Planning Section. We have three branches in the Planning Section. Tame and Planning, who's managed by Tammy Ma uh, Manning and Allied Programs, which is managed by Robin Barrows. Um, these are the topics I'll cover uh, related to the work that those two branches are doing. And then uh, the Rural Development Branch is managed by Patrick Nolson, and I'll, I'll wrap my presentation up um, talking about some upcoming uh, rule, rulemaking activity. So um, this is, wanted to start off by, you know, we, our, our primary goal is maintain an, uh, compliance, ongoing compliance with the uh, National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And currently we're over six years into demonstrating continuous attainment with our uh, federal public health air quality standards as of today, it's uh, 2,333 days. So. That's that's great news, um, and it's it's good for North Carolina air quality and our economy. One of the standards that we watch closely is um, the ozone standard, the 2015 standard in the Charlotte area. And we the standard is 70 parts per billion. This is an eight-hour average um, over three years, uh, using the fourth highest for the for the monitor. Um, used to calculate the design value, what we call the design value of the track compliance. But statewide, our design values are um, less than 65 parts per billion. And, it, and in, for uh, Mecklenburg County, the Charlotte area, the two monitors there, the design value is 66 parts per billion, which is down one PBB from last year. So um, we're trending in the right direction, but we still uh, are coordinating with Mecklenburg Air Quality um and our partners down there to make sure we'll, we'll continue to demonstrate compliance with the standard the um i also wanted to just uh highlight our ozone design value predictor tool the link is shown here this has turned out to be a very valuable tool for displaying um this is a screenshot um what it what these values are the circles are there are individual ozone monitors um and then the it's selected right uh on the what we call the 20 for 2022, it predicts what the design value, what our what our reading would have to be the trigger of violation of the standard in, in, in 2022. So it answers a lot of questions. So you click on a circle, it pops up the data for a monitor and it's, it's easy to access the information. So we, um, one of the other projects we're working on is an update to the uh, greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast. The previous report was published two years ago. It's on our website. This one is going to be completed by the end of this month, the update. It covers the period 1990 to 2030. Um, and we're focusing on three sectors uh, right now, that, which account for over 80% of the statewide uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And, 2022. These include the electricity generation sector, the transportation sector, and the residential, commercial, industrial fuel use sector. We've also got new information or method on our data, our methodologies for updating our carbon sinks inventory. So we're including a revision to that as well. The previous report, the historical emissions data went from 1990 through 2015, 16, or 17, and we're updating everything through 2018, and then our projections will cover the period 2019 through 2030. The most significant revision that we're making here is for the transportation sector, and the previous analysis was based on an EPA state inventory tool for preparing greenhouse gas emissions, and that tool didn't provide the granularity that we need to be able to track and understand what the emissions are associated with various types of vehicles and vehicle classes and vehicle in, uh, engine classes, uh, via vehicle miles traveled and whatnot. So we've moved, switched over to using EPA's MOVES model, which we use for the criteria pollutants to provide us a lot more details so that we can understand what the baseline emissions would be, for example, for the heavy, medium and heavy duty vehicles um the the things that steve talked about with the um uh vw funding and and be able to then understand or track or estimate what the emit, potential emission reductions would be uh, associated with with uh measures evaluated for those different types of vehicle classes and let's see uh, now i'd like to talk about uh our, my group does a lot of work on state implementation plans. So just a quick update on where we are with, 
with SIP activity. The regional haze SIP for the round two, we've completed the public comment period and the public hearing on that. We um, did have seven speakers at the public hearing in October. We've written, we received all, nearly 700 pages of comments. So it's taking time to go through those comments. We're considering each one of them care carefully. Um, and we have a goal of submitting the final plan to EPA um, by the end of February of this year. And then we have two SIPs related to the 1997 eight hour ozone standard. <clears throat> this is, uh, we have four areas in the state. Great, we have the Charlotte area plus the uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, the Triangle and Rocky Mountain areas. that are all maintenance areas for the 97 standard. So we had to submit, um, once you're a designated detainment, you're under a maintenance plan, you have to do, you're under that maintenance, maintenance plan for 20 years. So we do a, initially do a plan for the first 10 year period, and then we do an update for the next 10 year period. So that's what these plans are addressing is the second 10 year period of the maintenance, 20 year maintenance uh, uh, period for these areas. So um, these are under, uh, have been submitted to EPA um, and EPA, once we submit the EPA, they have 18 months to approve them. Um, so this is just providing some dates here of when we might expect approval of these plans from EPA. For the 2008 standard, we submitted a plan um, to EPA to update the uh, motor vehicle emission budgets for ozone and NOx because of changes in some of the modeling that supports uh, analysis of those budgets and EPA approved that uh, request back in August of last year. And then for the 2015 ozone standard, an infrastructure SIP, uh, when EPA revises the NACs, uh, an infrastructure, we have to submit an infrastructure SIP three years after EPA revises the standard. And it contains 14 elements that we need to address to demonstrate that we can carry out the programs needed to demonstrate ongoing compliance with the standard. One of those elements has to do with uh, interstate transport, what we call the good neighbor SIP, or there's really two elements. And so, We've, we've had, EPA has already approved the other 13 elements of our infrastructure SIP. This was the last one, um, which is great. Uh, they, you know, basically are acknowledged that we are not contributing to downwind uh, violations that attainment or maintenance monitors um, in downwind states for the 2015 standard. So this was, a, this was a approved by EPA um, last month. Uh, the last uh, uh, other SIP activity includes um, for the 2010 one hour SO2 standard, Brunswick County, um, EPA initially designated the six townships uh, in that county as a team at unclass, I'm sorry, as unclassifiable. Um, we subsequently, uh, the major SO2 source down there is shut down. Um, we have amb ambient monitoring data that we were able to, to compile and pull together and, and, and through that and, and, and projections and emissions, we were able to um, obtain EPA's approval uh, to reclassify those six townships to unclassifiable um, last September. And then we have through the transportation um, conformity memorandum of agreements, we have 13 of them with, and, and basically what these agreements do is they're with our local partners in various uh, uh, concerning transportation conformity, our local state and federal partners, and these are agreements that lay out a consultation process for uh, addressing uh, emissions uh, from, from the transportation sector in the, in the local areas. So these had an expiration date in them um, and we've, we've updated those uh, through uh, working with our, our local state and federal partners and submitted uh, a request to EPA last September to uh, update our SIP with, uh, with the updated agreements. And then we have uh, House Bill 85, uh, Session Law 2020-5, removed Onslow, Rockingham, and Lee counties from our motor vehicle emissions inspection program. Uh, we did submit um, a, a SIP revision and a non-interference demonstration EPA uh, back in December of 2020. Um, and so EPA uh, has until June of this year to prove that. It sounds like they might be issuing their approval, proposed approval in February or March of this year. So I think they're on track to approve that. And then the last item on an important program we've been tracking is uh, the medium heavy duty of uh, clean transportation program. In July, 2020, Governor Cooper um, 
signed an MOU along with 14 other states and uh, the District of Columbia to think about or begin uh, developing um, uh, goals and and uh, ways to uh, in, uh, to increase uh, the sales of uh, zero emission vehicles for the medium heavy duty uh, transportation sector. Um, these goals of 30% sales by 2030 and 100% by 2050 are included in the uh, Executive Order 246 that Governor Cooper signed last Friday. And so this is just to let you know that we're working with um, our other state uh, partners um, and in following what what's being done with with this uh, through this MOU with these other states. One of the things that we've you know learned is the demographic. The the 14 other states are primarily the Northeast Mid Atlantic states, and so our our geography and demographics are much different from those states. So the plan that we ultimately um, develop or that's ultimately developed, I, I think the lead will be uh, NCDOT there, um, will probably look much different uh, than than what uh, other states are doing. We have, you know, we're, we're more spread out um, and a lot more rural areas. And so we have different issues, uh, but those are being acknowledged and, and, and addressed. And then I'll turn to the real development updates. Um, these are the three topics I'll cover here quickly. The NOx SIP call uh, revision to those rules, the hearing process. Um, well, we, we completed the comment period in December, held a public hearing on December 1st, and we are in the and we did receive written comments from Duke Energy and uh, the US EPA. We're currently reviewing those comments in terms of and looking at revisions to the rules in the fiscal note. We'll be bringing those back to the uh, EMC for, in their March meeting um, to, to um, consider for approval. And then for the Title V rule revisions, uh, the commission approved uh, taking this out to notice in November of last year. So the comment period will be January 8th through the March 21st. And the public hearing is February 23rd. And uh, the hearing officer is uh, Commissioner uh, Duggan. And uh, we'll hopefully, um, once we've uh, received the comments and address those, we'll be bringing it back to the MC in May. And then uh, the last item is uh, potential future concepts. We expect to bring the AQC this year. One is the electronic submittal of documents. Uh, I think Steve mentioned um, in our digital do documents policy and we're also looking at, at uh, kind of going through all the rules to see where it, it says that the um, you know, affected entity needs to submit a paper copy and looking at a way to change that over to uh, electronic submittal of some kind. So we're looking at developing a, a, a concept for you all to consider, for the AQC to consider uh, this year. And then the, we've identified in, as part of the H-74 process, we've, um, there's several rules that uh, we've identified errors in that we would, um, we're compiling and, and would bring back to the AQC for consideration. And then finally, um, we are uh, for for OTD 0516. This is sulfur dioxide emissions from combustion sources. We're working to prepare the concept and exploring options options to support that concept. And that is the end of my presentation. Great, thank you. Go back down the list one more time for questions. Commissioner Bailey. Not hearing any. Commissioner Davis? No, thank you. Commissioner Deerhake? Also not hearing any, but I'll come back. Uh, Commissioner Lazorek? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Monist? Oh, thank you. Commissioner Deerhake? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about my audio today. I, I think it would be useful to, to hear more about Executive Order 246. I sort of stumbled across a press release. The commission was not informed directly. It's another example of how better to keep us informed about state actions. Um, a little surprised to see that Lee County was removed from the inspection program given its proximity to the triangle, but there may be good reason for it. Last thing is that um, in 
reference to the PSD program, I'm proud to say I finally visited Swan Quarter, which is our easternmost PSD class one area, I hope. Uh, it still is for North Carolina. Is that still correct, Randy? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Hey, I, I've always wanted to go to Swan Quarter and I finally made it this over Christmas. <laughs> well, good. Yes, thank you for those comments, Commissioner Deere. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bailey, did you have any questions? No, thank you for getting back to me, though. I had trouble turning on my audio. Yeah, understood. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Strait. In the interest of time, I think we'll let you go. Uh, Director Arbuzinskas, any comments? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just want to say thank you to the, the committee and other commissioners that were able to listen in today. We haven't done a division wide overview like that in many years. So thank you for the opportunity and, and thank you to our section chiefs who are pulling the material together and doing the presentations today and, and all the staff statewide. As you can tell, uh, there's a lot going on across our division and we really just give them the surface over the last hour and 15 minutes or so. There are two other items I just want to touch on briefly that, that we didn't cover today, more administrative, but it was a little bit of sprinkled in through some of the presentations, and that's uh, item related to resources. Our division currently has 26 vacancies, and we're expecting several retirements uh, that are coming up over the next couple of months. So, you know, one of our one of our main goals and one of my main goals here in 2022 is to focus on advancing our efforts to, to, to stabilize our funding and employ some strategies to build depth in critical areas. The silver tsunami that was mentioned earlier is real and upon us. And so that's going to be a big part of my focus in 2022. But with that, I know we're over time, uh, Madam Chair, so I will stop there today and say thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your patience today as we're meeting remotely again. Sorry for running over. The Air Quality Committee will next meet on March 9th and that meeting adjourned. Groundwater and Waste Management Committee, I'd like to call this meeting to order.